So staying healthy and in some degree, in, in, in some degree of fitness is important as we get older. I used to be into working out a lot when I was a young, younger guy, and uh, I really tried as I got older to, to still push the weights and still do all the stuff. And I realized that, that as my musculature changed and as my, my body changed, I needed to do some things that I could actually match with who I was now and not try to be some young you know, stud that I'm not anymore. And I, I, I know that comes as a surprise to you that I'm not a young stud anymore. But, <laughs> but it's important that we realize that as we get older, we need to take care of our bodies. And if we want to keep a body that's healthy and strong so that we can enjoy life, so that we can continue to be active as we get older, we need to think about the different things that we need to be able to, to, to do a little bit differently. Maybe, maybe we need to, to eat a little differently. Maybe we need to sleep a little differently. Maybe we need to come up with some workout routines that really fit us. Now, physical fitness gurus tell us that if you, if you really want to benefit yourself physically, then you must take care of your core. The core of your being is really important. The core is made up of, of your abdominals. It's made up of your obliques. It's made up of, your, of your, the muscles in the back of your, of your uh, muscles in your back, as well as what are called multifides, which are um, little muscles that hold your, all your spinal cord together. You've got to pay attention to all those different things. The problem is, in a culture like ours that is so caught up in physical fitness and obsesses about how people look and making sure that, that we all have the exact right shape as we, as we go through life so that we look really good, we kind of get lost in that and we, and we miss out on what's most important. We miss out on the thing that God really wants us to be about. Because we think that if we're a normal person and, and our shape is more like an oval, kind of like Mr. Potato Head, <laughs> then that's a bad thing. We feel like if we're not, if, if we have this sort of shape and we don't look like these people, then there's something wrong with us. And God wants you and me to know that that is not the case whatsoever. If we are supposed to work on our physical core in a way that will enhance the, the health of the rest of our bodies, there's another core that we need to think about. Another core that's even more important than our physical core. Let me remind you of a passage we looked at last week. This is from 1 Timothy 4, 7. It'll show up on the screen. For physical training is of some value. We need to make sure we take care of our physical bodies so that as we get older, we can continue to be active. We can continue to do things like a neighborhood rehab day. Um, I mean, we had people on, on our teams that were in their 70s and 80s out there working, slinging hammers, slinging paintbrushes, and we can do that, and it's important that we do that. But physical fitness, even though our culture and society tells us it's ultimate, it tells us that, that you're only of value if you're young and you're lean and you're svelte and you're handsome and beautiful and all that. And if we buy into that, we miss what God really wants us to do. I think it's important for us to be physically fit. Physical training is of some value, but, and that's important, but godliness or spiritual training has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. So even if you look like Mrs. Or Mr. Potato Head, you are still of ultimate value to God. And you and I have important roles that He wants us to play, things that He wants to do in our lives. Because just like having a physical 
core that's strong will benefit the rest of our physical body. Having a spiritual core that's strong will benefit all of your life. And that's what we need to be about. We need to make sure that, that we are putting value on the things that are valuable. Godliness has value for all things, holding promise for both the present life and the life to come. A disciple, one who follows Jesus, is someone who connects with God, we've said, right? We want to make sure that we're making a good, strong connection with God and with other followers of Jesus. That person continues on in their relationship and they, they, they love Jesus with everything that they have and their life begins to show it. And as they continue showing that, they grow in their spiritual maturity to become more like him. And as they become more like him, as we become more like him, we engage our culture. We engage the people we live next to. We, we engage the people we work with. We engage with the people that we, are, we, we just rub shoulders with on a day-to-day -day basis for the kingdom of God. Now, what is more important to us than anything else as disciples is making a good, solid, foundational connection with God. Making sure that our spiritual core is strong. Because if our spiritual core is strong, then all of our lives will be strong. And as we follow after Christ, continually strengthening that core, he will work in our lives and he'll work in the lives of those around us. So the passage we've, we've read already twice today, Acts chapter two, is a significant passage because what's happening in Acts chapter two is, is the Holy Spirit has shown up and nobody told the disciples what they were supposed to do. There was no manual. This was completely unplowed ground. It was a completely new path that was being cut through the wilderness. And what happened when the Holy Spirit showed up was he showed them how to strengthen their spiritual core so that all of their lives could be of, of value to God. So let's read this together. We've read it twice already. Let's read it together. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and signs, miraculous signs, were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods. They gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, excuse me, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily all those who were being saved. He gives us four spiritual exercises that will strengthen our spiritual core if we will apply these four simple things. First, before we get to the first one, he says that they were devoted. To be devoted to something means to attach yourself to something, to attend to it constantly, to busily be engaged with this thing or these things in this case. What he said is, these are not things you add to your life if you can find the time. These are the things that you build your life around. These are your spiritual core. And if you'll make the investment in these four spiritual exercises, then the rest of your life will be beneficial to God and will be spiritually healthy. Do you feel like you're physically where you want to be? If you say, well, no, Len, I'm really not physically where I want to be, then what you've got to do is make a few changes. You need to reconsider how much sleep you're getting. You need to evaluate what you're eating. So what you put in your body actually fuels your body instead of makes it lethargic and slow and fat and out of shape. And you might want to think about the kind of exercising that you're doing with your body. If this is the only exercise you get, you're probably not gonna be very healthy. How do you feel about where you're at spiritually? I mean, there are terrible things happening around the world. 
We don't even have to go out the, outside the borders of the United States. There are very difficult things happening within our country. And we're, we're praying for people in Houston. We're praying for people in, in Florida as they're getting ready for Irma to come. We're praying for people in LA as the fires are coming. We're praying for, for people in Montana where over half a million acres are on fire right now. We're praying for all these things just happening within our country and all the different things happening around the globe. How are you doing with all that? Are you afraid? Are you unsettled? Are you feeling unstable? Could it be that your core isn't as strong as it ought to be? Could it be that, that you are not applying yourself to these simple four spiritual exercises that could, and if we will apply them, will completely and radically change who you are and how you respond to the situations that you're confronted with. To be devoted means to attach yourself to, to be busily about engaging in these four things. So the first a spiritual exercise that will strengthen your spiritual core, he says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They wanted to learn more about what Jesus had taught the apostles because Jesus was the standard. Jesus was the authority. And since he wasn't there anymore, they needed to find it to get the information from those guys who were there with him. So they sat down at the apostles' feet and they let the apostles teach them. Now, here's what Jesus did. Jesus said, or the people that heard him speak, said, Jesus is different than all the other speakers we've heard. He's different than the Pharisees. He's different than the lawyers. He's way different. This is what they said about his authority. Look at this passage with me. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as the teachers of their law. They wanted to hear from Jesus. So Jesus' plan was to teach his disciples to make a connection with them so that they could then engage their culture. And that's exactly what we see happening because Jesus took the authority that had been given to him and he conferred it to the apostles. Look at this passage. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus said. Therefore, go. You go with my message. And he's talking to the, the apostles right then. And there's a large group that were there, but I think he was looking right at them. He's looking in Peter's eyes, and he's saying, I want you to go. I want you to make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all the things that I have taught you, because I am with you until the end of the earth. Jesus had authority. He conferred that authority on his followers. And then God used the teaching of the apostles to build the foundation for the church. He calls it in Ephesians, the household of God. And he says in, in, in this passage in Ephesians that the church is built upon the foundation of the prophets, Old Testament prophets, and the apostles, the New Testament teachings. God's household, the passage says, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ as the chief cornerstone. So the very first thing that they did was they devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles. They wanted to hear what Jesus had to say. So it's important for us to strengthen our core to make sure that we are spending time in the word, right? We need to make sure that we have that personal, individual time in the Word. But notice that the context here is not of a personal Bible study. That's important. But the context was them studying the Word of God together. They devoted themselves to studying the Word of God together. Now, as you come here on Sunday morning, that's what this is. We're looking into the Word of God together. But if you want to go deeper, if you want to do it more in a corporate setting, there are two other settings that you can be involved in. 
One of them is our life classes. They happen on Sunday mornings. That's, that's with people of all different generations and ages get together and we study the word together. And we've got some really awesome life classes that'll be kicking off in a couple of weeks. I just want to give you a heads up that they're going to be happening so that you can make the time. Set it aside. After worship is done at, at, at 1045, at 11 o'clock, they'll start. And you can be involved in the word, learning it that way. But there's an even deeper way you can go. If you really want to be devoted to the word of God, then you can be involved in a life group. Life groups are, are small groups that meet in people's homes throughout the week. Today at the, the pastor's meet and greet, you'll hear about some of those life groups and how you can be involved in them when they meet throughout the week. But these are opportunities for us to get together, to study the word of God together to make sure that we're understanding what it has to say and applying it to our very lives. Study the, study the word as individuals. Study it together. Any Awana clubber can tell you their theme verse. Any, any adults here want to tell me the theme verse for Awana? Okay. Where's the reference? Second Timothy 2.15 Study to show yourself approved. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That's what we're supposed to do. Now that's a theme verse for the children on, that meet here on Wednesday nights, but it's, it's a theme life verse for every single follower of Jesus. Study to show yourself approved. Doing it on your own is incredible. We must do it. It's the life blood of a follower of Jesus. But if we really want to go deeper, we really want to understand the word, we need to, to be in a context where we can discuss it with somebody else. Where we can say, you know, I think it might mean this. And they're like, no, 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 look at this. It doesn't mean that at all. And we can really challenge each other. Or maybe, as you're studying, God prompts you and, and tells you, hey, here's the decision you need, to, you need to make. Here's the change you need to make in your life. Well, if you're just sitting there by yourself and you say that to yourself, who's going to hold you accountable? No one. No one. But if you're in context with someone else who loves God and loves you and cares enough to say something to you, you have some accountability. You have opportunity for growth. We need each other. See, that's the whole thing about this entire series that we're entering in on today and, and strengthen our spiritual core. The core of everything in our relationship with God hinges on how we grow with one another and how we relate to one another. So we start by devoting ourselves to studying and applying the Word of God so, the second core value, then, is really critical. And it kind of enhances what we've already said. The second um, spiritual exercise is devoting ourselves to the fellowship. Devoting ourselves to the fellowship. Now, the interesting thing, if you just do a, a casual reading of the book of Acts, you'll find that the, the, the first disciples, they met daily, they cared daily, they spoke with others about Jesus daily. They searched the scriptures. They increased in numbers daily. They were interacting with one another on a daily basis. The Christian faith was a day-to-day -day reality because Jesus had come into their lives and radically changed them. And when the Holy Spirit came inside, they would never be the same. They didn't just add a Bible study to their lives. They didn't just add a convenient worship time to their lives. It was their core. They studied the word together. They fellowshiped together. Now you might be thinking to yourself, you know what, Len? Okay, but they lived in an agrarian society. And those who weren't out in the fields, they were fishermen and fisherwomen. They were doing those kinds of things, so they had a lot more flexibility with their discretionary time. And, well, you know, we're just much too busy for that. We don't have that kind of discretionary time. Okay. Maybe that's true. But imagine with me that you go home today 
And as you open your door, you're met with heat that's hotter inside your house than it is outside the house. You run over to the thermostat, you notice it's like 95 degrees inside your house, and you're thinking, what in the world happened? So you go down to where your air handler is, and you are not happy when you step in ankle-deep, tep tepid water because your air conditioner is gone. Three days later, the plumber's been there and taken care of everything. You've had your carpets professionally cleaned. The drywaller is just finishing the patch on the wall. And you're waiting for the painter to come and paint the wall so it matches the rest. Now, if somebody had come to you and said, I have, I have a project I want you to do with me. It's going to take you 10 hours over the next three days. What would you say? No, I'm sorry. I just don't have that kind of time. But when the air conditioner calls, we find time. The point? We will make time when something's a priority, when it's got to get done. Do we have that kind of commitment to spending time in the Word and fellowship with other believers? Do we have that kind of commitment? Or, or are we just adding things on? You see, if we're not careful, if our core isn't strong, then what we could end up with is, well, we could end up with all kinds of funky-looking lives to where things just are, are weird and they, they don't make sense and they, they aren't very helpful and they're not very practical. <laughs> and things kind of fall apart. Could it be that when the Holy Spirit came and the natural outcome was that these people spent their time in the Word and they spent their time fellowshipping with one another, that that was what He wanted us to do? Now, the next two core strengthening exercises actually explain for us what fellowship means. They actually describe and define for us what fellowship means. So, we first start in the Word, then we spend time devoted, we devote our time to fellowship, and then we devote ourselves to the breaking of bread. Now, what in the world does the breaking of bread mean? Some people take this to mean that it is the, um, it's the taking the Lord's Supper, which we do here on the first Sunday of every month. And I think that might be an application here, but honestly, I really don't think that's what this passage is talking about. There's only one other place in the New Testament where this particular phrase is used. You remember the, the time in the book of Acts, uh, excuse me, the book of Luke, chapter 24, where there's two guys. They've just witnessed Jesus' crucifixion. They know that he was taken off the cross and put in the grave, and they are sad. And they're walking from Jerusalem to a place called Emmaus. And as they're on the road, and they're talking about what was happening, somebody walks up next to them and says, hey, what are you guys talking about? And they say, are you the only person in the whole world who doesn't know what happened? And he said, well, I guess so. Tell me what happened. And they start telling Jesus what happened. They didn't recognize him. And as they were telling him all these things, he finally stopped them. And he said, really? Well, let me tell you what this was all about. And it says from Genesis on, he, he explained who he was and why he had to come. Later on, the guy said, wow, our hearts were burning inside of us as he told us what was happening. So as they come to the house that they were journeying towards, Jesus acts like he's going to go a different direction. They say, oh, no, 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 no. You've got to come in and tell us some more. Come in and have dinner with us. And he sits down at dinner. And it says, look at this passage. The two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. See, they're reporting this back to the apostles and he's telling them what happened. And when he broke the bread, something clicked and they realized what had happened. Now, still that's not super clear. So let's look uh, a few verses prior 
And this is what was happening. When, when he, he, that's Jesus, was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he began and to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They were just enjoying a meal together. It wasn't the Lord's table. Later on, the church added the Lord's table, and they, they began to call it the love feast, and we, hear, we read about that in 1 Corinthians 11. However, this was just spending time together over a meal. It's amazing to me that um, still to this day, statistics say that families grow stronger, relationships with parents and kids grow stronger and stronger if families will do just one thing if they will make sure that there is a communal meal every day, a time to connect with kids, a time to connect with one another, a time to be there with each other. So it, it makes great sense that if we want to get stronger in our spiritual core, that we would also have time where we spend together over a meal being together with one another. That's what happens in many of our life groups. To begin their evening together, having a meal together, doing life together. In Acts chapter 2, verse 46, we read, They broke bread together in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You've probably experienced this proverbial truth in your own life. 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, Bad company corrupts good character. Well, if that is true, the opposite is true as well. Good character, good company, excuse me, enhances good character. If you're struggling to live the Christian life, maybe, maybe what you need is to invest yourself in someone else and let them invest themselves in you to make sure that you're spending time with other believers so that you can get stronger in your faith and so that you can help them get stronger in their faith. This week, I, I had somebody describe the Christian life in a way that I'd never really thought of before. I, I really like this phrase. He said, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. I think that's a great way to look at ourselves. We invest so much time making sure that this physical body looks the best it can. How much time are we investing in our spiritual core to make sure that it's strong and healthy so that we can continue moving forward, doing God's kingdom work in this life for however many years God gives us? Investing in the things that are the most important. We are spiritual beings first and foremost. What kind of investment are we making in our spiritual core? If I invest myself and my resources in fellowshipping with other believers, it strengthens me and it strengthens them. The fourth and final core strengthening exercise that was part of the first disciple's spiritual core um, strengthening regimen was a devotion to prayer. Just read through the book of Acts and you see that they prayed privately, they prayed publicly, they prayed all the time, they were con continuously in, in, in conversation with God. Now remember, prayer is not some sort of, of official sort of thing that you need to do with, with the specific words. Prayer is just having conversation with God. In whatever situation you find yourself, we don't have to, to be in church. We don't have to be anywhere in particular or be any so, in any sort of position. Matter of fact, some of the most effective prayers are, are, are just God help when we don't know what's happening. They devoted themselves to prayer. I really like the way the message kind of captured the idea of what prayer is about when it translated or paraphrased 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is what, what uh, the message says. The first thing I want you to do is pray. 
Pray every way you know how, for everyone you know. Pray especially for rulers and their governments to rule well, so... So... We can, be, we can be quietly about our business to live, of living simply in humble contemplation. This is the way our Savior God wants us to live. Simple. God's not asking us to, to write flowery words. He's asking us to take the time and talk to Him. Now, to pray without ceasing, as one passage says, 1 Thessalonians 5.18, or as this passage says, to live a life of prayer, we want our, our minds to be continually directed towards God. As I'm driving down the road, I'm listening to God. I'm asking God, God, what do you have for me right now? As, as my boss or coworker is coming unhinged, Lord, what do you need to say to me right now? How do I need to handle this situation? As our hearts are breaking for friends and family members or just people in general down in Houston, God, how do you want me to interact with this? How do you want me to get involved? And we're talking to him about everything. We're not just praying, God, help me pass the test that I didn't study for. We're not just praying, God, I really studied hard, help me pass this test. Those are valid prayers as well. Well, the second one is. <laughs> but it's a lifestyle. It's a mindset. We're constantly thinking about how God wants to live his life through me. Remember, it's not my life, it's his. And I'm supposed to be a good manager of his resources, his time, his finances, his everything. The core of my spiritual health will be enhanced when I connect with other believers, when I connect with them as we study the word together, as we, as we spend time together eating a meal together and praying together. It's simple. It's life. Now, is the punchline going to be that you have to do this every day? That Len's here to dump a bunch of guilt on me? No, not at all. The punchline is this. Most of us kind of relate better to this than the real handsome people we had up on the screen. If we want this spiritual core to get strong, if we want to be useful for God's kingdom, then we ask him to help us know what's the kind of foundation that I need to build for myself in my relationship with you? How is it that you want me to live for you right now, God? And I know that I can't do this on my own. I need other believers to help me what do you want me to do and if you're if you haven't at this point been doing much of, of anything then ask him how he wants you to start or maybe if you've been doing some things and you're not feeling that you're growing and getting stronger like you really wish you were then maybe God is saying to, will say to you, here's what I want you to do. Here's the piece I want you to pick up. Because the goal and the purpose isn't for us to feel guilty. The goal and the purpose is for us to follow after God so that he can make us, remake us in his image and help us to be the person that he designed us to be so that we can be stronger, so that we can be healthy, so that we can all be put together in a way that God can continue to use us. So that when people see us, they see something different. 
Interesting thing about this passage that we often overlook is what actually happens when you have a community like this. When you have a community like this, people notice. See, here at First Baptist, we talk about our oikos. Oikos is the Greek word for house or household. We talk about those 8 to 15 people who know you well enough to say the hard things to you. Those people with whom you have some influence, those are your oikos. And so as they see the changes in your life, they're the ones who are going to notice. And I'm not talking about reaching all of them. I'm talking about maybe even just praying about and reaching one. And if they see something different in you, because your core, your spiritual core is getting stronger, because you're spending time in the Word with others, breaking bread together, praying together, and God is transforming you. Look at what it says in the end of this section of Scripture. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. That would be awesome if it stopped there, but it doesn't stop there. It goes further. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. I think sometimes we take things on ourselves that, that, that God never intended us for us to have. We feel guilty because we're not on the street corner standing on a soapbox preaching the gospel to somebody. Where God has brought people to us. Eight to 15 people, probably more. And if they see a change in you and they see a change in me, then God is going to bring them. God's going to draw them. God's going to make a difference. It's not about what we do. It's not about what we say. It's about what God has in mind. It's about how God is going to work through me and through you to reach people. Whatever physical shape you are in, even if you're like Mr. Potato Head. Devoting ourselves to studying and applying God's word. Devoting ourselves to fellowshipping with one another. That is breaking bread together. Spending time with other believers. And praying. Will bring about huge changes in us. And huge changes in those around us. I, my prayer for us. Is that we would grow a healthy body personally, and as a community by committing to growing a strong spiritual core. Let's pray together. God, you know what needs to happen in, in each of our lives. You know if, our, if the time that we spend in your word with others is enough, if we're growing healthily that way. If, if you want us to spend more time enjoying the company of other believers to help us get stronger so that we can have more strength to engage those around us who are not yet followers of Jesus. If you want us to be people who are praying for, with, and over other people more than we do currently, whatever you want us to do, God, we, just, we, we offer ourselves to you and we ask you to help us to strengthen our spiritual core so that we can be a healthy and thriving body to do your kingdom work for many years to come in this community. In Jesus' name, amen.